Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Patrick Madden, the Executive Director of the National Archives Foundation. On behalf of the National Archives and the Foundation, happy 4th of July. What a great day. Thank you for spending part of your holiday with us. We are delighted that you're joining us for these, pro for these programs today. And you should know that folks have told us they are coming from all parts of the country. All 50 states are represented. You couldn't pick a better day to spend with the National Archives. Well, we just heard from President Jefferson in the last hour, and shortly we'll hear from Abigail Adams. We have these programs running until 4 p.m. Eastern time, when at that time, the National Archives will broadcast its annual reading of the Declaration of Independence program. It's very special. This is the 50th anniversary that the Archives is doing this. You won't want to miss it. Fast fact for you. Did you know that the National Archives holds over 12 billion documents, millions more photographs, maps, films, and recordings? With more than 40 facilities around the country, including all of the presidential libraries, the National Archives is really our country's memory. In a minute, minute you're going to listen and hear from Abigail Adams, and you'll be able to ask her some questions. And so I would like to point out on the chat, just next to your video and YouTube, you can ask your questions there, either while she's talking or during the Q&A. Right now, if you'd like to practice, tell us where you're watching from. We'd love to see what, what parts of the country are represented on this program, and we'll give you a shout out later on. And now it's time for our special guest. Allow me to introduce the former First Lady and someone who knows all about the revolution and the founding of our country, Mrs. Abigail Adams. Mrs. Adams, happy fourth to you. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm well, thank you. How are you? I must say you're looking splendidly smashing in your vestments today. Very good, thank you. Well, we're delighted to have you. Tell us a little bit about the time when our country just started to get formed? Well, first off, I should like to again say good morning, or, or is it good afternoon now? Or perhaps I should just say good day. Um, um, I am indeed Mrs. John Adams, and I was born in Weymouth, Massachusetts. Early in 1771, shortly after his successful defense of the soldiers accused of murder during the Boston Massacre, my husband John sent word that he had that day accepted a position in the Massachusetts State Legislature, a position which would most surely see to his ruin, to my ruin, and to the ruin of our children. He was telling me this, that we all may prepare ourselves for our fate. Now, I believe I'd been preparing myself for such a fate ever since I married the man in 1764. Now, our first child was born during the Stamp Act, our second during the Townsend Acts, when we were all participating in the boycott of British imported goods. And when the bloody massacre had happened in 1770, I was once again great with child, and I could even hear the commotion happening just north of us at the State House. That year, my husband chose to prove to the world that the lobster backs could get a fair trial even in Boston, and he engaged in the defense of the eight most hated men in America. Prepare myself for my fate. I would say by 17 and 71, I was well inured to quite anything and prepared for most everything. As a patriot, I had already eschewed tea, I'd made homespun, I tended to my farm, educated my children, but my greatest sacrifice was that my husband would be apart from his family at a time when the joint admonitions of both parents sink deeper than in mature years. My husband would depart for Congress in Philadelphia in 1774. But he would be home for but a few months when, in April of 75, we saw the death of many of our American brethren at the battles of Lexington and Concord. And he was again back in Philadelphia when little Johnny, oh, that's John Quincy Adams, <laughs> well, when he and I climbed up Penn's Hill behind our home to witness the bombardment of Breed's in Bunkers Hill, we heard that day of the heroic death of our dear friend, Dr. Joseph Warren. Now, the American relationship with our parent country was really at an end. We just needed the Colonial Congress to make it official. If we were to throw off the chains of servitude that held us bound to the King and Parliament, American men, women, and children required leadership from our elected officials to inspire the communion of patriotism within our hearts and in our minds. By July of 1775, to our universal satisfaction, we had word from Congress of the appointment of Generals Washington and Lee. 
Now, I had the pleasure of meeting both of the generals soon after their arrival in Massachusetts. I was struck with General Washington, but I thought not the half of was told to me about him. Dignity with ease and complacency. The gentleman and the soldier look so agreeably blended in him, and modesty marks every line and feature of his face. Those words of Dryden instantly occurred to me. Mark his majestic fabric. He is a temple, sacred by birth and built by hands divine. His soul is his deity that lodges there, nor is the pile unworthy of the god. General Lee, on the other hand, looked very like a careless, hardy veteran. Uh, the elegance of his pen far exceeds that of his person. In December of that year, I was very politely entertained by both of the generals, and General Lee was particularly determined that I should not only be acquainted with him, but with his companions too, and therefore he placed a chair before me into which he ordered Mr. Sparta to mount and present his paw. I could not do otherwise than accept it. That, madam, says he, is the dog which Mr. Adams has rendered famous. <laughs> well, the new year eventually turned, and at the close of 1775, the king and parliament declared the colonies in open rebellion and outside of British protection. The American Prohibitory Act did more to solidify the colonies against the king than all the skirmishes and taxes thus far. John wrote to me of the action. It throws 13 colonies out of royal protection, levels all distinctions, and makes us independent in spite of our supplications and entreaties. It may be fortunate that the act of independency should come from British Parliament rather than the American Congress. He also sent me a copy of Common Sense by Thomas Paine. I was charmed with the sentiments of Common Sense and wondered how an honest heart, one who wishes the welfare of their country and the happiness of posterity, could hesitate a moment at adopting them. In March, with the British occupying Boston for so many months, I had been kept in a continual state of anxiety. Although I was six month miles distant from Boston in Braintree, one day I could feel the house shake. I ran to the door and found it to be the cannonade from our army. Oh, there would be no sleep for me as long as the cannon continued firing. I went up to Penn's Hill where I sat to hear the amazing roar of the cannon from there I could also see every shell which was thrown. The sound, I think, is one of the grandest in nature, and it is true species of the sublime. The incessant roar would not abate until a Monday night when we got possession of Dorchester Hill. Four thousand American men were upon it by Tuesday, and we'd lost but one man over that weekend. It was after this that the British were forced to depart Boston, taking their Tory sympathizers with them. From Penn's Hill, we had a view of the largest fleet ever seen in America. We could count upwards of 170 sail. They looked like a forest. The Tories on deck, though, looked a little bit crestfallen. What would others say to common sense? I could not bear to think of continuing another year, of, uh, another winter in a state of supineness. There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted? All the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea we are now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. Well, that's not me, that's Shakespeare. <laughs> well, anyway, the tide was indeed upon us in 1776. By March 31st of that year, I began to feel impatient, and I wrote to my husband, I long to hear that you've declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by laws in which we have no voice or representation. Such of you as wish to be happy, willingly give up the harsh title of master for the more endearing one of friend. He responded by calling me saucy. On April 14th, he would write, as to declarations of independency, be patient. Read our privateering laws and our commercial laws. What signifies a word? Then he went on to say, as to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh. We have been told that our struggle has loosened the bands of government everywhere, that children were grown 
disobedient that schools and colleges were grown turbulent, but your letter was the first intimation that another tribe more numerous and powerful than all the rest were grown discontented. This is rather too coarse a compliment, but you are so saucy, I won't blot it out. Depend upon it. We know better than to repeal our masculine systems. Although they are in full force, you know they are little more than theory. We are obliged to go fair and softly. And in practice, you know, we have the name of subjects only. Um, and, and rather than give up this which would sub completely subject us to the despotism of the petticoat, I hope General Washington and all our brave heroes would fight. I'm sure I got a little bit of John's words wrong, but that was the gist of the letter. <laughs> so my response on May 7th was quite to another point. I cannot say that I think you very generous to the ladies. For whilst you are proclaiming peace and goodwill to men, emancipating all nations, you insist upon retaining an absolute power over wives. But you must remember that arbitrary power is like most other things which are very hard, very liable to be broken. And notwithstanding all your wise laws and maxims, we have it in our power not only to free ourselves, but to subdue our masters, and without violence, throw both your natural and legal authority at our feet. I also took the opportunity to remind him that a government of much more stability was wanted in this colony, and they are ready to receive it from the hands of Congress. And since I have begun with maxims of state, I will add another vis. That a people may let a king fall, yet still remain a people. But if a king lets his people slip from him, he is no longer a king. And as this is most certainly our case, why not proclaim to the world in decisive terms your own importance? Shall we not be despised by foreign powers for hesitating so long at a word? Now, finally, it would come. John's letter dated July 3rd, 1776. Yesterday, the greatest question was decided which ever was debated in America, and a greater perhaps never was or will be decided among men. A resolution was passed without one dissenting colony that these united colonies are and of right ought to be, free and independent states, and as such they have, and of right ought to have, full power to make war, conclude peace, establish commerce, and to do all the other acts and things which other states may rightfully do. The second day of July 1776 will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, shoes, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. You will think me transported with enthusiasm, but I am not. I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and support and defend these states. Yet through all the gloom, I can see the rays of ravishing light and glory, and I can see that the end is more than worth all the means. I did change the date to July 4th based on the declaration. <laughs> you see, his letters never failed to give me joy, and I was even more greatly heightened by the prospect of future happiness and glory for our country. Nor was I not a little gratified when I reflect that the person so nearly connected to me had had the honor of being a principal actor in laying a foundation for its future greatness. In mid-July on a Thursday, after hearing a very good sermon, I went with the multitude into King Street to hear the proclamation for independence read and proclaimed. Some field pieces with the train were brought there, the troops appeared under arms, and all the inhabitants assembled there. When Colonel Crofts read from the balcony of the State House the proclamation, great attention was given to every word. As soon as he ended, the cry from the balcony was, God save our American states, and then three cheers which rended the air. The bells rang, the privateers fired, the forts and batteries, the cannon were discharged, the platoons followed, and every face appeared joyful. Mr. Bowden then gave a sentiment, stability and perpetuity to American independence. After dinner, the king's arms were taken down from the state house, and every vestige of him from every place in which it appeared, and burnt in the King's Street. Thus ended royal authority in this state. 
beyond politics, domestic health concerns would fill that summer of 76. Earlier that spring, when the British left Boston, the smallpox remained in their wake and prevented my going into town. Several people had broken out with it in the army since they had went into Boston. I think the country was in more danger than ever. And I was truly anxious about it and longed for the opportunity to take the inoculation. After the determination was made to turn Boston into a quarantine city for the smallpox, I went with my children for the treatment that summer. The pox inoculation was as trying a time as I've ever known. All of the children but Charlie seemed to take the pox well enough. I mean, all were laid low, but not so low as to give me a fright. Except Charlie. Four times we tried, and it seemed that it never took until finally, I believe, by being surrounded by the pox, he took the air of it in the natural way, the most dangerous way. He was delirious for days. I would keep him by my side at all times for a minute-by-minute minute check on his health. The disease finally appeared to abate and turn, and he was safe. In 1777, John would receive a commission to the French court, and I would be separated from him for longer than I'd ever expected. In almost 20 years of our marriage, we'd not had the pleasure of spending half of that time together, and I felt as though I were living the life of a nun in a cloister. Yet in all I knew that my husband was needed by his country, even more than he was needed by his wife and children. You see, if independence was not secured by this generation, what would that mean for the next? We could not relegate our children and their children to a life of continued servitude under British rule. I'd say it were better never to have known the blessings of liberty than to have enjoyed it and then to have it cruelly ripped away. John's fight for the next five years would be in the halls of our European allies and eventually to the court of St. James and the Treaty of Paris, which ended the war. Ardently, as I longed for the return of my dearest friend, I could not feel the least inclination to a peace, but upon the most liberal foundation. Patriotism in the female sex is the most disinterested of all virtues. Now, excluded from honors and offices, we cannot our attach ourselves to the state or government from having held any place of eminence. Even in the freest countries, our property is subject to the control and disposal of our partners, to whom the laws have given a sovereign authority. Now, deprived of a voice in legislation, obliged to submit to those laws which are imposed upon us, is it not sufficient to make us completely indifferent to the public welfare? Yet all history in every age exhibit instances of patriotic virtue in the female sex, which, considering our situation, equals the most heroic of men. A late writer observes that as citizens, we are called upon to exhibit our fortitude. For when we offer our blood, your blood, to the state, it is ours. In giving it our sons and our husbands, we give more than ourselves. Men can only die on the field of battle, but we women have the misfortune to survive those whom we love the most. I will take praise to myself. I feel that it is my due for having sacrificed so large a portion of my peace and happiness to promote the welfare of my country, which I hope for many years to come will reap the benefit, though it may be more than probable unmindful of the distaff hands that also blessed them. I, I, I thank you for your kind attention to my comments. <laughs> oh, they were quite wonderful. Thank you for, uh, giving us that insight on the time uh, that, that in the experiences that you had. Are you willing to take a few questions from our guests? Oh, I'd be delighted. I love Wonderful. We have, uh, we have folks from all over the country, uh, some places you may be familiar with, like Pennsylvania, New York, and North Carolina, but also Los Angeles, California, Gulf Shores, Alabama, Dallas, Texas, Illinois. It's, it's uh, wonderful that... Uh, people today are sharing their day with us. So I wanna remind our visitors that uh, to ask questions, you need to use the chat box to the left of your video on YouTube, but we have had a few come in already. Uh, you were starting to talk about this towards the end. One question, do you think women might make better leaders? Ah, uh, well, in my day, of course, women are largely undereducated, which is a, well, bugbear that I continue to have with any gentleman that I should come in contact with. I think women, if 
we do not hold the reins of government ourselves, then I see no reason why we should not be critical of how those reins are conducted. But the only way that we can engage in a meaningful conversation about politics, about government, about leadership, is if we are educated to the facts of those causes. So I do believe we must walk before we run, we must crawl before we walk. So once women are educated, once we are mindful and able to have the leisure time to be mindful and familiarize ourselves with causes, I see no reason why we should not become involved with them. Very good. Was it harder to be a wife or the mother of a U.S. president? <laughs> well, um, I, I suppose you probably are talking about uh, when I'm in the mother of a president, you're, you must be talking about my John Quincy Adams. I do predict great things for that boy. And well, when John went to Europe, Johnny went with him. He was educated at the University of Leiden. He speaks, reads and writes six different languages. He was basically raised to be a statesman. Um, I would say though, because children are always hopefully more mindful of their parents. I, I tried to raise my children with a good degree of respect for both myself, John, and anybody who had a position of well, intellectual knowledge that they could grow and learn from. But I raised them to be respectful and mindful of such people. So uh, having a husband like John Adams, who has great respect for those opinions that he agrees with and considering that well we were often in agreement on many things but not always everything it i would say it's probably more difficult to be married to a, a president than to be the mother of a future president for your children will hopefully always look up to you as long as you are worthy of their respect and can you uh related to that talk about your relationship with some of the other first ladies you might have known? Oh, well, um, the only other president's wives that I was very familiar with, well, I was very familiar with Lady Washington. She and I became very good friends in New York in particular. And General Washington, well, I'd known General Washington for goodness over 15 years before he became the president of the United States. So I had a very good relationship with the Washingtons in particular and a very long and sustaining one. Um, Lady Washington, I found to be a woman of the most excellent sort. Uh, she was very plain in her style of dress, but everything was always of the best quality. Um, she was very mindful too that her guests should always be comfortable in her presence. So she always went out of her way to make sure that people had what they needed. Well, for example, when I, when I attended at the court of St. James's, the king and the queen, they would leave you standing about in a room for hours while you waited. You had no seat, no beverage, no food, but you had to wait almost for four hours to finally be let out of that room. The Washingtons, on the other hand, and Lady Washington in particular, made sure that her guests could have a seat, that they were invited to punch and cookies in the next room once they had met the president at one of their levees. Indeed, it was Lady Washington who began the very first Independence Day celebrations. The first year that General Washington was president, she would open up her home in first in New York and then in Philadelphia, to anyone of the town who was properly dressed. She set out boards and tables with cake and punch, and everybody could enjoy the celebration of independence. It was not so with the King and Queen of England, mind. So I think the Washingtons in particular set the standard and the example for what would be American diplomacy and American congeniality in our new republic. Very good. Well, you, you may not know that we are dealing with a, a health crisis in the United States right now. And you mentioned smallpox. So one of our viewers asked, how did you en endure the smallpox crisis? Well, it was a crisis actually that had been part of my life for my entire upbringing. John, indeed, actually, before we were married, even took the smallpox inoculation. He was to be a lawyer on the bar circuit. So he knew he would be traveling about the countryside and did not want to bring that disease home to us. It was a very fearful disease and very, we, we, we didn't know how you caught it. We just knew it could be caught and that it could wipe out an entire family. 
So John took the inoculation. Now, while my mother was alive, she was very fearful that if we took the inoculation, we might actually lose our lives from it. So she did not encourage me to take the inoculation. But the previous year, we'd lived through another epidemic in 1775, the dysentery, which affected us greatly. Indeed, I lost my own dear mother from that epidemic. So I did not want to let the smallpox affect our family. And with the upheaval of the countryside, there was possibility through the inoculation to save oneself from the worst ravages of the illness. So when Boston was opened as, as an inoculation city, you could see Boston had a causeway. You could get into Boston. Anybody could walk into Boston, but you could not leave Boston unless you had proven that you had had the pox and were thus immune to it. So it was a decision that I made, one that particularly with Charlie's ill health and the week that we spent wondering if he would even be alive to see the autumn. Well, it was a decision that I made, but one that I am glad given the future of well, the uncertainty of the future. I'm glad I made that decision to have the children inoculated, but it was a fearful time. You were away from your husband for quite a long time. How did you endure that? Well, um, fortunately, I usually had my children about me and I was able to um, educate them. I, I had I think the most difficult part of my husband being away was actually the finances of it all, honestly. Um, the last time John was able to actually work as a lawyer and bring in a steady income to our family was in 1777. So after that, and for many years, it was very difficult to actually be able to pay for our home, our taxes, give contributions. But um, I had devised several means by which to assist in our family finances. First. When John went to Philadelphia, I asked him to secure pins, as many pins as he possibly could. Three times I asked him for pins, and finally he sent me 6,000 pins. Now, I didn't need 6,000 pins, mind, but the ladies in my community did. So I bundled those pins up and I sold them at a fair price, mind you, not at an exorbitant importer price. And I was thus able to help increase the family economy. Now, this mercantile exchange I took on for the next many years. And while John was in Europe, it continued. I was able to get even better goods for our community, goods that the embargoes and the boycotts and the, sh the, the lack of ability to engage in free trade had stifled during our war. So I was able to get silks and scarves and gloves and fans and tassels and fabrics and things that the ladies of the community had wanted. So this did actually keep me more engaged perhaps than just taking care of the laundry, which mind you can take two days in my time to do a good laundering. So between my children, my farm, my house and my mercantile business, I was kept quite busy. I also write lots of letters, letters to my husband, letters to my friends, and I read I read everything that I can get my hands on. That is indeed a, a solace that I will enjoy for my entire lifetime. Very good. We have time for just a few more questions. We've had a number of questions about uh, women's voices and women's rights. Um, did the majority of the women during your time share the same views and the strength of the voice around women's rights and their role? Well, I would say it's possible that more women than you think certainly grumbled about not having rights to ownership of property. I can think the most personal problem for most women were rights to the retaining and the distribution of their dower property. When a woman comes into a marriage, she has property that she brings to it. Now in my day, that property, upon saying I do, upon the signing of that marriage agreement, that woman's property would become the property of her husband to do with as he saw fit. So his debts, his dalliances, these would all be paid for out of her dower property. Now, if something should befall the husband, if he should land in debt, if he should be injured, if anything, her property goes to pay for his maintenance first. There are many women who would 
either lose their husband or their husband had children from a previous marriage or whatever, but they, they would find themselves in a difficult legal embattlement upon the determination of their dower property, their own rightful property. And as a woman did not have the right really to represent herself in court, she needed a man to present her case to the court. Well, she was at a loss for defending herself and for retaining of her own property. So that was the first place where women really began to feel the pinch, I'd say, of unfairness in our government system. When I asked my husband to remember the ladies and be more kind and generous to them, it was particularly about dower property and woman's property that I was referring. Not necessarily a vote yet. Again, education is paramount before one casts a vote. Believe me, I believe men should be educated before they cast a vote as well. But <laughs> all in, in good time, all things, I suppose. Very good. Well, we have time for one more question. Uh, since it's such a, it's a holiday and a big celebration, lots of folks are doing a lot of cooking. And so I was wondering, uh, did you like to bake? I, I have a bit of a sweet, a sweet tooth. Do you have any favorite desserts? Well, actually, I'm I will say we like to have simple food around our house. John likes a good roast for dinner and, and we always have apples put up in the basement and I particularly also like cranberries. But one particular dessert that we like, um, no, I've even made one today. It's an apple pan dowdy or an apple pie. <laughs> so there, this will be for later. Um, Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us on this special day. It was lovely hearing your perspective and interesting insights. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to our colleagues at the National Archives in New York City, education specialist Sarah Lyons Davis, with a fun activity for everyone. Sarah? Thank you, Patrick. Abigail Adams famously reminded her husband, John Adams, the second president of the new nation, to remember the ladies when drafting laws for the United States. She wrote to him, if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. She believed in the education of girls, and we can learn of her view on the revolution and American independence through surviving letters. She and John Adams exchanged over 1,000 letters throughout the course of their lives. You can explore some of these letters and others from the Founding Fathers Papers Project through Founders Online. It will be many years before the same breadth of rights was extended to women as to men. It was not until 1920 over 140 years after Abigail Adams penned that phrase, that women would win the right to vote with the ratification of the 19th Amendment, now in its centennial year. Even that did not include all women across all ethnicities, races, and class. Americans would keep striving to form a more perfect union, expanding these rights to all groups through protest, legislation, and the courts. These measures have long been involved in enacting change in our country, with men and women fighting on the forefront, both literally and figuratively, to bring about these advancements. Women were involved in the revolution and fighting for independence in many different ways. Deborah Sampson Gannett was one of a handful of women who fought in the Revolutionary War disguised as men, but only one of two women to receive a federal pension for their service, the other being Margaret Corbin. In 1781, Gannett enlisted to serve in the 4th Massachusetts Regiment under the name Robert Shirtliff. She received multiple sword and bullet wounds and received an honorable discharge in 1783. You can read her sworn testimony in support of her federal pension from the U.S. government in Doc's Teach for clues about the experience of a woman serving in the Revolutionary War disguised as a man. They document that her service record was lost during the burning of Washington by the British in 1814 and provides a thorough accounting of her service in the Revolutionary War. In 1792, the General Court of Massachusetts awarded her a pension, citing her extraordinary instance of female heroism and by discharging the duties of a faithful and gallant soldier. In 1805, she petitioned the state of Massachusetts for an invalid pension, as it was called. Her petition was supported by Paul Revere, 
a fellow supporter of the cause of independence from Great Britain. Flags, streamers, and lanterns have been used in celebration of American independence since the days of the American Revolution. Symbols have conveyed messages and demonstrated ideas. Join me in creating a patriotic windsock to hang in your window. You can include symbols like the one shared in the packet or select your own design. I already have my materials ready and as you see, I already cut the bottom off a cylindrical cardboard oatmeal box. You could use a coffee canister or even the cardboard tube from a paper towel roll for a narrower windsock. So I'm next going to cover the box with blue construction paper, and then I'm going to glue on white and red construction paper stars, which I also have already set. So here we go, and you can put those wherever you'd like. After this, we're gonna cut red and white crepe paper streamers, and we're gonna glue or staple them to one end of our windsock. I'm gonna just put those on the bottom. I'm gonna alternate with the red and the white. So after we do this, I'm going to punch four holes along the top of our windsock and cut two pieces of string about a foot long. You wanna make these holes just opposite each other. So you're gonna tie the opposite ends of string to holes on opposite sides of the cylinder. And then after we do this, you're gonna tie a longer piece of string to the smaller pieces. So we're just getting this all set. And I have one already completed here. You can see how we did this and you'll hang the windsock from this longer piece of string. So you're all set now. You can hang your patriotic windsock from your window or porch. And remember to share what you create with us. You can tweet us using the hashtag archives July 4. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, that was lots of fun. We'll hear from her again in the next hour. Before we wrap up, I want to make sure you know how to get a hold of some patriotic swag like this shirt or from our women's collection. We have this Declaration of Independence that an artist has made a slight adjustment to. And we have wonderful scarves, not quite right for me, but for the woman in your life uh, at the National Archives store online. Uh, you can visit us at archivesfoundation.org. And today and only today, we have a 50% off the entire site. If you use the code Liberty. 50. That's the word liberty and the number 50. We hope you'll visit the website, archivesfoundation.org, where you can also check out other programs and activities that the foundation supports in Washington and around the country. Maybe you'll consider membership in the foundation. Allow me to thank our sponsors, John Hancock and AARP. They're terrific partners, and without their support, July 4th at the National Archives would not be possible. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors, uh, excuse me, our members who support us year round. Um, they make all the things happen that we can support the outreach work of the archives. I hope you'll tune in shortly uh, for our next guest, John, John Dunlap. He had quite a big role in getting the word out about the Declaration of Independence. So you're going to want to tune in. On behalf of the National Archives and the National Archives Foundation, thank you for spending part of your day with us. And while you're waiting for the next program, don't forget about us on social media. Use the hashtag ArchivesJuly4 and share a little patriotic love. Let us know what you're doing on this holiday. Until our next program at the top of the hour, wave your flags, enjoy your patriotic day, and happy July 4th.